In this uh, video, we are going to try to model, to give the first models for the returns that can appear in a financial time series. That means the simple returns or obviously the log returns as we have, as we have seen before. Hmm? This, okay. Since we talk about distribution, we have to just make a small reminder. This is the joint distribution in or notation for the random variable X and the random variable Y. Joint distribution, joint cumulative distribution function, which can depend on the parameter theta. Theta can be a vector. For example, for a multivariate normal distribution, theta is mu uh, 1 the mean of the the mean of x mu 2 the mean of y sigma 1 the mean of x sigma 2 the mean of y and um, the row let's say row x y most of the time this is the uh, covariance or the correlation between x and y and therefore if you want to get the cumulative distribution function for uh, X and Y joint cumulative distribution function, you have to integrate the joint density function in the case of a normal distribution, for example, FXY has the formula, uh, the well-known formula for the bivariate uh, normal density function, FXY of WZ, this is integrated with respect to W and Z, uh, Z goes from minus infinity to Y and W here goes to minus infinity to X here. If you make this double integral, you get the cumulative distribution function for X and Y, joint cumulative distribution function. If you want to get back to the marginal distribution function, you have to uh, put all the, va the, 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 the values of Y, you have to put them to infinity, as it's, it is classical in uh, probability, in a basic probability course. You put um, Y equals to infinity in this formula, or Y equals to infinity here, and if there are different components of y, if y is a vector, for example, you have y here, which is y1, y2, y3, and so on. The imagine this is a vector of, of, a, of a random variables. In this case, you put infinity for all these variables inside the vector. And for you have y1, y2, y3 in this column vector, which is put to infinity. And you have here does the joint distribution of x and y, where all the components of y are put, are made equal to infinity. In this case, this joint cumulative distribution exactly equals to the marginal uh, cumulative distribution uh, of x. The we could we could say okay, it's a, maybe it's a random variable, maybe it's a vector of random variables. In this case, if it's a vector of random variables, x you have here x, which is a vector also of fixed values x1 x2 x3 this is the probability in this case that the first component of x is smaller than x1 the second component of x smaller than x2 uh, third component of x smaller than x3 and so on up to the dimension of x here uh, the definition of the quantile uh, most of the time in basic courses you have a definition of a quantile function which is uh, uh, use, which is um, most of the time defined for continuous cumulative distribution function. We we say most of the time, okay, you have, uh, for example, f x minus one of p. This is uh, quantile. That means, for example, uh, you have here. Uh, the probability that x is smaller or equal to uh, xp, we say most of the time, we write that like this, xp, we say that this is p, therefore xp is, uh, ah, problematic, just, I have to move a bit, yes, my screen here, this you have uh, here, this quantity is fx of xp. 
Therefore, you have the probability that x is smaller than xp. Let's say x is a random variable in this case. The probability that x is smaller or equal to xp. This is p. In this case, we defined in basic courses of probability, we defined xp as the quantile of order p of x or of the distribution fx, the distribution of the random variable f, the distribution of the random variable x. And therefore, the cumulative distribution of x is denoted fx, and at the point xp, it is equal to p. This is, most of the time, the definition of the quantile of order p. And when you have that, you can imagine immediately, if you have a strictly increasing, uh, increasing function fx, you can immediately say that xp is exactly equal to f minus 1 x of f minus 1 x of p and this is the result which is here this most of the time this is the way we define a quantile function therefore you have in this case a function like this which goes to 1 you have uh, x here you have fx here and you say okay uh, i want to have the quantile of order p how do I calculate the quantile of order p? I just have to invert the function fx, and here you have in this, no, sorry, here you have x, xp, mm -hmm. and xp, this is exactly equal to fx minus 1 of p, like this. Mm -hmm. But this is for an increasing uh function a continuous increasing strictly increasing even uh, cumulative distribution function for fx now imagine that you are in a different situation imagine you are in a different situation where you have a jump somewhere where you have a jump Therefore, I have another graph like this, and okay, that increases. That, 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 okay, it's an increasing function, let's say. Huh? It's an increasing function. Uh, fx is still an increasing function, but at the moment here, there is something like a jump here, and after it goes in like this, and you have this a distribution function here. Um, like this. Here you still have fx, here you still have x, but now you have a case where my okay, cumulative distribution function uh, fx is not continuous. There is a discontinuity here, you can see. Mm -hmm. And in this case, you want to compute the quantile of order p here. And if you want to invert this function, it is a bit more complicated, as you can see here. Uh, yeah, what, what happens? Because there is nothing here. There is nothing in this area. Let, let's imagine you, you want to get, you should put dots, I'm going to write with another color to, to make it more, more understandable. To imagine here, you want to invert in red. What happens here? There is nothing. How do you invert? How do you invert the uh, cumulative distribution of x in order to have something here which should be the quantile of order p for this uh, uh, for this distribution of x? It's okay to, to solve this problem. It's not really a problem, but to, to give a quantile of order p to this distribution, we define this quantity. And we say in this case, xp is not f minus 1 of x f minus 1 x of p anymore but this is here the smallest value let's say infimum the smallest value of x such that f of x is larger or equal to p therefore what is the first point on the x-axis what is the first point which is such that f of x is larger or equal to p it's here it's here you are in red perfect here here you see f of x this is the first value of x in the increasing order such that f of x is larger than p therefore okay 
we take the smallest value of x and therefore we say okay in this case i go here and i say here is xp xp ah again a small problem i have to put it a bit up like this um, in order that we we see exactly what what i'm doing um, here you see now xp is defined here and this is the smallest value of x such that the f of xp here is larger or equal to p the smallest value of x such that f x of this x f x of xp in this case is larger or equal to p okay we have a definition of a quantile uh, which is adapted to uh, increasing yes function but with discontinuities in the case of the cumulative distribution function of the random variable x a quantile is really useful in in finance huh? most of the time a quantile it describes uh, the 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 maximal risk which is acceptable let's say huh? uh, we we know we, we define we define in finance what we name value at risk but a value at risk i won't insist on that here maybe we will have the opportunity to see that later but value at risk this is nothing but a quantile of a distribution hmm? uh, in finance and we uh, have at the end here the, the distribution uh, of x given the fact a conditional distribution given the fact that y is smaller or equal to y in this case we use the the bias idea of probabilities therefore this is a probability that x is smaller or equal to x y smaller or equal to y divided by the marginal distribution of the y's with respect to x maximum marginal with respect to x you know what i mean this is the probability of y which does not involve x this is in a way is in that way this is the idea of uh, marginal distribution therefore okay we have the the probability of the intersection between the two events x smaller or equal to x and y smaller or equal to y and at the denominator we have the probability that y is smaller or equal to y we have conditional densities marginal densities joint densities here that are defined in the case of independence between the set of random variable x and the set of random variable y we have the product of uh, marginal densities which is equal to the joint density hmm? therefore i don't insist on that because this is something that everybody knows and what is uh, more interesting in a finance course is to study more than moments of order one and order two in basic priority courses you have a moment of 41 this is the mean of x this is the moment of 41 of x the moment of 42 of x this is the mean of x square and the, the, the centered moment of order two this is exactly the variance of x therefore we talk about in general of moment of order l this is defined by this integral from minus infinity to infinity of x to the power l here times density uh, for a random variable x and let's take a univariate random variable x in this case and the l central moment ml this is the mean of the difference of x and mu and and its mean mu of x x minus its its mean but to the power l therefore the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x minus mu of x to the power l here times density um, f of x dx Therefore, if L equals 2, we see that this corresponds exactly to the variance. Why is it interesting? Because in finance, we are going to study these two additional, let's say, central moments. But it's a bit more than central moments because here you can see that we have a central, a third central moment but divided by sigma x squared. And here a fourth central moment but divided by sigma x to the power 4. I would like to... Uh, change here my page in order that we can uh, make some graph and understand what happens with these two quantities that are named skewness s of x this is skewness 
k of x, this is kurtosis, kurtosis. And sigma x, this is the standard deviation of x, therefore this is the square root of the variance of x, uh, sigma square x, sigma square x, this is the variance of x, and here if we take the, 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 the positive square root of that, we get sigma x, which is the standard deviation of x, and this is the sigma x which is involved here in these two formulas for skewness and kurtosis respectively. We name also kx minus 3 what the excess kurtosis. Why excess kurtosis? Why 3? Why k of x minus 3? Because in fact when you have normal data, for normal data, for a normal distribution, it can be shown that the kurtosis is always equal to 3. Therefore kx minus 3 denotes a kurtosis which is an excess kurtosis with respect to the normal distribution. And a distribution with positive excess kurtosis, this is named a leptokurtic distribution. And a distribution with negative excess kurtosis is named platykurtic. Uh, I'm going to, 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 to explain that a bit because we need, I think, people who make just one course of finance understand very well what is the skewness and the kurtosis but just for a reminder uh, what is the skewness what is the kurtosis why is it important to talk about this leptokurtic and platykurtic situations these platykurtic situations yes let's just show what is a skewed distribution and i'm going to to uh, to write that here. Before we take a, a graph like this, this is an axis, let's say x. Here, look at this. This is a distribution which looks like a normal distribution, except that here we can see that there is a tail. This is a tail. There is a, a, a heavy, a heavy tail on the right. And here the tail, and, and here uh, on the left here you have a lower tail here you have a, a heavier tail we say you have a tail on the right that means that the moment of order three because here you have some more here the, the mean the mean of um, of, um, of this distribution uh, the mean of this distribution is somewhere is somewhere here huh? here you have the mean of this distribution let's say this is mu x mu x which appears here in the formula. In this case, what happens? You have big x minus mu x to the power 3. This is important. You have a heavier tail on the right. You have uh, big quantities x minus mu of x to the power 3 when x is in this, lies in this area. And here you have smaller values of x minus mu of x when x is in this area. What does that mean? That means here in this situation you have a positive skewness. Positive skewness. But obviously you could have a negative skewness. In this case, if you have a negative skewness, you have... Oh, it's not really nicely drawn. I'm going to make it better. And say, okay, in this case you have like this, something like this. You see here, you have a heavier tail on the left, and in this case, you have a negative kurtosis. In pessimistic situations, this is usual, these kind of things. Huh? Uh, if we talk about returns or gains that you can get from an asset or for a portfolio, yes, what does that mean? If, if we talk about the gains, yeah, often you have asset, which have a return which is positive, but for which more often you have uh, the, the gains that are negative or below, let's say, a given mean. In pessimistic situations, you have a skewness which is negative for assets. It's more likely that you have negative uh, gain, that means a loss. Uh, more likely to have that than having a positive 
gain a positive, uh, yes, for a, a good return. That is for the for the skewness. And okay, what, what the kurtosis? Could we have a representation of what the kurtosis is? Yes, we can have it. We can have it. And I'm going to represent it here. Here you have the normal distribution, let's say. Well, it's not really nicely drawn again, but anyway. This is a distribution for which you have a negative uh, excess kurtosis, a kurtosis which is smaller than the kurtosis of the normal distribution. And here, I'm going to say this and this, like this. Ah, this is not really nicely drawn again. But you have here a kurtosis, which is larger than the kurtosis of the normal distribution. Hmm? Don't like that at all. Uh, yeah, this I'm going to try to draw it better way. Like this. Yeah, it should be more decreasing here. It should be more decreasing. Hmm? But in that case, in the green case, you see in the green case, you have a kurtosis, a kurtosis, K, which is larger than 3. And in the case here of the red, you have a kurtosis which is smaller than 3. And in the normal disk, in the normal case, you have a kurtosis which is exactly equal to 3. Therefore, the, the normal case, the red curve, the red bell-shaped curve here corresponds to a normal. It's not exactly a normal uh, <laughs> when you see what I draw, but okay, imagine it's a normal. You have a kurtosis which is 3. In the red case, you have a distribution which is leptokurtic. In the green case, you have a distribution which is... Oh, sorry. <laughs> In the red case, you have a distribution which is platykurtic. Kurtosis smaller than 3. And in the green case, you have a distribution which is leptokurtic. Kurtosis is larger than 3. Smaller than 3 in the red case. Uh, platykurtic. Larger than 3 in the green case. Uh, leptokurtic. What does that correspond to? The green case is, in fact, a more usual case in finance. It's a very important quantity in finance, the kurtosis. Because we have observed during the last year, and especially during the different crises uh, that uh, occurred in the past, we obviously noticed, we obviously noted that uh, the, the risk corresponding to a loss, the risk corresponding to a loss, if this distribution, let's say, represents the possible values of the loss for, let's say, a portfolio or for an asset. Uh, yes, we have seen, we have observed that the normal distribution does not fit correctly the distribution of the asset. Yes, the losses can be really larger or the gains can be really larger than what is predicted by the normal distribution. Normal distribution says, okay, imagine you have normal 0, 1. That means that after 3 or before minus 3 in a normal distribution, here and here, let's say, the probability to get something higher than 3 or smaller than minus 3 for a normal, for a standard normal distribution, we, we see that in, in bachelor courses, the probability is almost 0. Therefore, this distribution, the normal distribution, has tails which are really uh, too low, too low. They vanish too quickly. They go to zero too quickly. That means that to, to model um, distributions of returns, it is not good to use a normal distribution. And we are going to see that later again in this course. But the normal distribution, what we can see when we observe data, I think they are 
some data that are observed here. Uh, here, for different assets here, you have the simple returns, you have the log returns here, daily, let's say, and you see the excess kurtosis. Oh, la, la, la. really larger than zero. Really larger than the kurtosis for a normal distribution. That means that you are in all of these situations, you are in a leptokurtic situation, a kurtosis and excess kurtosis larger than zero. But really larger than zero, you see here 25, 36. And by the way, we can see also in this table for these assets that we have negative kurtosis, more often losses than gains. Okay, let's go back to uh, this, uh, these, this, uh, these distributions. Therefore, I hope that we understand here that, okay, in the real world, kurtosis are really often larger than three, meaning that the normal distribution is not, most of the time, is not adapted to uh, financial situations. That's the reason why we have to study those moments here, else central moments uh, at the factor. We have to study this skewness and this kurtosis. And that's the reason why here we, 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 we have estimates for this. Uh, you know how to estimate the mean, you know how to estimate the variance uh, in order that it's, not, it's unbiased. Uh, this is the, the classical estimator for a variance that we see in the basic courses of uh, probability and statistics. And statistics, uh, one divided by the number of data minus one to avoid the bias of uh, sigma uh, hat x square here. Okay, and if you want to estimate a skewness or a kurtosis, you have the estimators that are displayed here. Therefore, a sum, obviously it's a mean, huh? therefore you have the sum um, and the uh, different terms of this terms are of this sum are powers three of differences between xt minus mu hat x and here for the kurtosis xt minus mu hat x to the power four here and we we, we have to divide by an estimator of the uh, you remember here you have the standard deviation to the power three or a standard deviation to the power four therefore this is obtained here you you have here this is standard deviation to the power two if you put the square root of this and after you put the power three you get here the estimator sigma hat three x that you have to insert here to estimate the skewness and if you put the square to this formula you you insert this formula inside the formula for the estimator of the kurtosis and therefore you have here the way uh, to calculate estimates for the kurtosis with estimators. This is made by the software that you use most of the time. Therefore, these quantities are computed by the software but are really important to assess the quality of your assets, how is it asymmetric and how uh, risky it is according to the, the, the hate, I would say, of the tails here uh, that can be computed on uh, a given asset. For this, you have tests as well. You have tests, here you have statistical tests for the skewness and for the kurtosis. Therefore, if the data are normally distributed, we can show that an IID data as well. It's not written here, but the data R1, RT, or IID are supposed to be IID under the null assumption uh, when we test, therefore, the skewness and the kurtosis. Uh, and we have here the estimator for the skewness as well as the estimator for the kurtosis minus 3. We can show that these two estimators are asymptotically normally distributed with a mean, with zero mean. Uh, for under the normality assumption, if the data are normal, it's normal that the skewness has, has, a, has a mean zero and the kurtosis as mean three, therefore the excess kurtosis as mean zero. And thus we have that these two uh, quantities have normal distribution with mean zero and variances respectively six over t, the length of the of the time series, and 24 over t. Yeah, maybe I didn't say it, but in the normal case, it's obvious, huh? in the normal case, uh, you have a skewness 
which is zero because uh, we, we saw the skewness here there is not in the case of normal distribution there is no heavier tail on the right or on the left as i said hmm? no obviously the tails are the same on the left and on the right that means that these two quantities as this quantity sorry as head of x is zero in the normal case this we can test if the skewness is zero or not in a way we can test the the normality assumption in uh, for the returns with these statistics you see here that you have a skewness at the, denumer at the numerator and the square root of the variance at the denominator the same is computed here for the statistic that is used for the test for the kurtosis uh, for under the null here we have skewness zero under the alternative skewness different from zero if skewness is different from zero that means that the returns are not normally distributed here under the null in this case we have a kurtosis which is three under the alternative the kurtosis is not uh, three and therefore in this case also that means that the data are not normally distributed hmm? okay from this it's also possible to uh, develop one-sided on the right one-sided on the left uh, tests for the skewness and for the kurtosis obviously huh? and yeah obviously you can imagine that under the alternative you don't have s of r uh, um, different from zero but sometimes you want to prove that s r is strictly negative in this case this is a, a, a test um, this is a one-sided on the left test here most most of the time you don't want to prove k of r minus three different from zero but k of r minus three strictly larger than zero for that means um, uh, one-sided on the right test saying that okay you you are not in the normal situation but in the green situation in this case most of the time you have this alternative this the, under the alternative uh, assumption you have k of uh, r strictly larger than three and in this case obviously you adapt the statistics for that according to uh, if you have a two-sided test you you have um, you have absolute values uh, if you have a one-sided test you don't have the absolute values of the statistics but all that is seen as basic in basic probability in probability probability and statistical courses and therefore it's not the object it's not the aim of this course here therefore i won't uh, focus on that here if you want to know more about the one-sided test on the right or on the left you go back to a bachelor course and you will see how the stat how the statistics should be modified in order to uh, have a, uh, in order to have a one-sided on the right or one-sided on the left test but the computer does it for you most of the time just hmm? now what i wanted to talk about is what should be a good distribution for my returns for my simple returns or for my log returns and i can say okay first let's try the normal distribution we know that it won't work we already we have already seen that it won't work at all hmm? But you can say, okay, uh, imagine why does why does the normal distribution not work? Imagine that you have R i t. We have just let's say t equals one to t. This is an i d sample, and imagine that these R i t are normally distributed. Is it possible? The question is: Is it possible to have R i t? which is normally distributed not necessarily rit what is rit we we can go back to that rit rit the gross return no not the gross return the uh simple the simple return simple net return 
pt minus pt minus 1 divided by pt minus 1 this is equal to pt divided by pt minus 1 minus 1 this quantity is larger than 0 does that mean that rit is larger than minus 1 rit is larger than minus 1 there is a lower bound on rit and a normal distribution for iit we know that normal distribution has an infinite support the values for a normal distribution the values of x if x is normally distributed the value of x the values of x go from minus infinity up to infinity and here we have a return a simple return which has a lower bound which is minus one therefore the returns can only go from minus one to plus infinity that does not correspond to the possible values of a variable which is randomly distributed which is normally distributed the domains the supports are not the same rit goes from minus one to plus infinity and a random variable which is normally distributed its values go from its values go from minus infinity to plus infinity that does not work another important argument against the normal distribution is the following when we have a return for we have a return like this we have a return we have a, um, we imagine that we have a return which is normally distributed this return is for one period but one period what is one period this is one month for example this is one year for example maybe it's two months maybe it's three months and if we say that a return let's say for one month is normally distributed that should in a way imply logically i would say that a return for two months should also be normally distributed a return for three months should also be normally distributed why does the fact that we have a period of one month make that the data are normal and for two months the data would be not normal uh, or for three months the, the, the data would become normal again is it possible that no it, it would be strange and when we talk about one month two months three months that means that we have in mind uh, the, the fact that we have uh, multi-period returns huh? r i t of k this is the multi-period uh, for k periods this is the return for k periods and the return for k periods what is what is the return for k periods uh, we remember that we have one plus r i t of k what is that hmm? if we go back i'm not going to write it because uh, we have seen that clearly before before i go back here to just to show uh, okay one plus r t k this is a product of things this is a product of gross returns hmm? and what we say this okay we have let's say rt which is normally distributed one plus rt is this which is a constant therefore this is also normally distributed is it possible let's say that a product let's say of normally distributed data is still a normal distribution has still a normal distribution is it possible when we have let's say a normal distribution for this normal distribution for this normal distribution for this let's say imagine all the returns are normally distributed or the simple returns are normally distributed is it possible that the product of these gross returns corresponding gross returns is also normally distributed nothing says that huh? in probability and in statistics what we have in probability and statistics what we know is that if we have independent 
normally distributed random variables, the sum of these of these normally distributed random variables is also normally distributed, but not the product. That's again an argument against the normal distribution for the classical returns. Therefore, RIT, classical simple return, imagine you want to model it with a normal distribution, three very big arguments against this normal distribution. The first one, the lower bound, which, which does not correspond to a normal distribution. The fact that if you have multi-period returns, it's not normal anymore, huh? not necessarily. And as we said before, we saw in the table before the positive excess kurtosis for many uh, uh, assets makes that normal distribution is absolutely not reasonable. This, what you're going to uh, say is, okay, we can use what is named a log normal distribution. Log normal distribution. This is a positive distribution which has something like this shape. You see that that, that looks like a chi-square distribution. This is a log, this is the density that of a log normal distribution. What is the definition of a log normal distribution? We say that if x, if x, imagine if x is distributed according to a log normal distribution, uh, therefore with this positive uh, density, uh, with this positive density for x, log of x is distributed according to a normal distribution. If you put the logarithm, if you take the logarithm of these values, these values can become negative, thus here, because they are values between 0 and 1 for x. Therefore, if we say that if, if x is log normally distribu distributed, that means that log x is normally distributed. This is the definition of the log normal distribution. You can go and see that on the internet very easily. You will see what are the different characteristics of this normal distribution. Why is it interesting here? Hey, this is because we have, uh, we, we know what is RT. Huh? RT, uh, the log return, this is exactly a logarithm of 1 plus RIT. Hmm? Like this, we name it RT. IT like this. Huh? Um, yes, there are two indices, I and T. T corresponds to uh, the time, therefore this is the value of the return at, at time 1, time 2, time 3, and so on, but, R, but I, let's say, that corresponds to asset I. Huh? Therefore, if you have a portfolio, you have portfolio with 10 assets, let's say you have i, which is equal from 1 to 10. Okay, thus we have this formula. We, we know that the log returns, the log return equals this uh, formula here. Therefore, if we say RIT, RIT, let's say it is more or less log normally distributed. But we know that RIT is bounded uh, below with minus one. Therefore, if we take one plus RIT, this quantity, the gross return, one plus RIT is bounded below by zero. Therefore, one plus RIT could be modeled with a log normal. If we assume that 1 plus RIT is distributed according to a log normal, the logarithm of this quantity is normal. That would mean that in this case, the log returns should be distributed according to a normal distribution. The log returns should be distributed here according to a normal distribution. And here you have 
the first two central moments of the returns, of the simple returns, uh, if RT, let's say, if RT, if RIT, for one asset, but we can remove the i eh? if we talk about a generic asset let's say this this is normally distributed therefore imagine rt is this is normally distributed it has a mean let's say mu and a variant sigma square and therefore if rit is normally distributed with these two uh, moments or central moments it's easily shown it's possible to see very easily that you can write in this situation the first two moments of RIT or RT, the, the, the simple returns. The mean of RT is simply given by this exponential of mu plus sigma square divided by 2 minus 1. Mu and sigma square are the parameters of the normal distribution for which RIT is distributed, RIT is distributed according to the normal distribution with mean mu and variant sigma square. We find back these two parameters here to calculate the first moment of the simple return and the second central moment of the uh, uh, simple return is, simple net return, is calculated with this formula, exponential of 2 mu plus sigma square multiplied by exponential of sigma square minus 1. And this involves as well the moments of the uh, log normal of the, of, the, of the normal distribution of RT here. And we can also find, we can also have the moments or central moments of RT computed as functions of the moments, central or not, of capital RT. Of the simple returns, simple net returns, and that can be obtained like this: m1 and m2. Let's say m1 is the mean of RIT, and m2 is the variance of RIT. This is now the mean of a generic uh, log return can be written as a function of these M1 and M2, the same for the variance of RT. Function of M1 and M2. This now, the problem of the lower bound that we had here, the problem of the lower bound, if we model RIT with a log normal distribution, just one plus RIT exactly as a log normal distribution, we don't have any more the problem of the bound because RIT is here uh, has no lower bound. The log return has no lower bound. The domain of RIT, the support of RIT goes from y minus infinity to plus infinity. And if now RIT is normally distributed, the normal distribution has a support which goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. No problem. Therefore, this problem is cancelled, discarded. More than that, the multi-period. If we have a multi-period log return, as we have seen previously, the uh, multi-period log return is simply the sum of the log return, of the log returns for each period that appear in the considered multi-period. We have seen that previously in the, the previous video exactly. Does that mean that if we have a normal distribution for a log return, this is the case here, yeah, it is really possible that the sum of log returns is also normally distributed. Therefore, in this case, we also have this second argument against the normal distribution for simple returns, which drops out as well. It disappears if we assume that RT is normally distributed and not therefore the log return 
okay, normally distributed and not, the uh, simple net returns. But we still have problems because of positive excess kurtosis. The log normal distribution, you can see, uh, therefore that means normal distribution for RT. For RT, if we go back to the table here, we see the log returns, and if you see the log returns, you really you have really high excess kurtosis as well. And here, if we assume that RIT is normally distributed, yeah, that does not fit this very positive excess kurtosis. Hmm? Okay, thus we have to find other ways. And there are other ways to uh, model the uh, log returns. For example, here what is named stable distribution. The stable distributions are very strange because they have infinite moments. This is the big problems of these distribution. Infinite variance, for example, here for the Cauchy distribution. But the, 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 here is the density of the Cauchy distribution. This distribution, okay, it, it works well to model the returns, the log returns of a distribution. It captures excess kurtosis. Also, it's possible to see that the sum of uh, random variables, dependent random variables distributed according to a stable distribution is also distributed according to a stable distribution. There are properties of this type. This is not the problem. But what is really strange is that in this kind of distribution, if you compute it, you can see on the internet if you want to compute that, you will realize that, okay, the variance, you imagine the variance of an asset, which is infinite. It means that the dispersion of the variance of the variance dispersion, sorry, of the values of your log returns, this is infinity. Infinity. How can you make calculations with that? How can you calculate anything with that? Uh, an asset which is infinitely risky, I would say. The dispersion is infinity. Yeah, this is a distribution which does not enable us to make correct, nice, interesting calculations. And this another possibility is to talk about mixtures of distribution. What is a mixture of normal distribution in this case? Um, a mixture of distributions this is a distribution for which the density is a sum, a weighted sum of densities. For example, a weighted sum of two normal distributions. And the weights, the first weight, the sum of the weights is one. Here you can see the, the weights here. You have one minus x and x, one minus x plus x. This is one. You could have more than two normal distributions. You could have three, four, five distributions. In this case, we only show the case of a mixture of two normal distributions. How can we see that in practice? Look at this. Going to, I'm going to represent uh, a mixture. Here is a mixture of two normal distributions. In fact, you could you could imagine that you have a first normal distribution, which is here, let's say, and a second a second normal distribution, which is here, let's say. You have two populations, a population which is more or less here and another population which is more or less here. And you say, okay, with some probability, one data comes from the first distribution or from the second distribution. Most of the time you have uh, a Bernoulli distribution with a probability P or a probability alpha here, 
a probability alpha, you have a probability alpha that you have a data which belongs to the first population here, the first population, and you have a probability one minus alpha. I'm going to put one minus alpha here, a probability one minus alpha that your data belongs to the second distribution. And you can imagine that uh, it works like this. Each individual has a probability alpha to be in the first population and a probability one minus alpha to be in the second population. And if the individual is in the first population, it is distributed, the return corresponding to this individual is distributed, the, the, the return, the, the log return for this data is distributed according to a normal distribution, let's say with mean mu1 and variant sigma1 square. And if the return, the log return belongs to the second population, it is distributed according to a normal distribution with mean mu2 and a variance sigma2 square. So for here we have a normal distribution in both cases. And you have this, my distribution like this. This is, that is what is written here. This is for, you imagine that the density of the log returns is something like this. Here there are two modes, but you can merge them can merge them. I think there is a, a mixture here where you have, when you have mu1 and mu2, which are close to each other, huh, you have, uh, you, you may have uh, uh, a distribution, a density here, which looks like the density of, uh, you see here, there is a mixture. Uh, you, you have a, a density which is bell-shaped as well, which has the shape of, of a normal, of a classical normal distribution, but it's more flexible in the sense that, for example, you have a first variance which is small for, let's say, less, less risky assets in the first population, and a sigma 2 square which is larger to have uh, assets which are more risky in the second population, let's say. Therefore, this density can model higher tails on the left and on the right. Since by playing on the parameters, mu1, mu2, sigma1, sigma2, mu1 and mu2 are close to each other most of the time, but if you have sigmas that are smaller and larger, you may model more important kurtosis. It's possible to, uh, you can model uh, more important tails on the left and on the right. That means more important kurtosis. That uh, density is able to capture excess kurtosis. Okay, not like a stable distribution, but in a better way than a classical normal distribution or in a better way than a log normal distribution for the log returns. In this case, no problem. If you want to compute the mean or the variance of a random variable which is distributed according to a mixture of normal distributions. It's really easy uh, because it's a combination of the mean and of the variances of each normal that appear in the mixture. Therefore, you can compute high horror moments. You don't have infinite variance, for example. And you can also have the tractability uh, you also have the tractability of normal since finally uh, the mixture of normal distribution is a combination of normal distribution simply. But the disadvantage of this is that you have, you may have, uh, yes, more complicated procedures to get the parameters. You increase the number of parameters. Huh? In the log normal distribution, you have two parameters. Normal distribution, you have two parameters. Here already you have mu1, mu2. Mu1 and mu2, yes, often they are the same, but that is the first parameter, let's say. Sigma1, sigma2, that makes three parameters, and also alpha. You don't know what is alpha. This is the probability to be in, in, the, in population one, and probability to be in population two. This is one minus alpha, therefore this is 
Yes, for, for two normal distributions, here you have alpha, mu, sigma 1, sigma 2, already four parameters. And a, normal dis a mixture of two normal distribution is not always the best fit for, for returns. You have to construct a mixture of three normal distributions that make a gain that, that gives, uh, that lets to more unknown parameters that you have to estimate, sometimes four normal distributions and so on. Therefore, yeah, you see here the mixture, <laughs> it can model kurtosis in a slightly better way than the normal distribution. But, okay, it captures better than the normal, it captures excess kurtosis better than the normal distribution, but you see that Cauchy distribution captures better uh, the, uh, the excess kurtosis. Here, in fact, you have a graph of uh, what happens for, I don't know, uh, yes, this is a comparison of three distributions. And uh, yes, on this graph, you can see that, okay, the mixture seems to be better than the normal distribution to capture excess kurtosis seems to be slightly better, but the Cauchy distribution, as you can see here, captures heavier tails, clearly. This, yes, there are other, a lot of papers in the literature, in the financial and statistical literature, to provide uh, distributions for the returns that can handle this problem of calculating a correct, estimating a correct excess kurtosis. There are distributions from Azalini in the literature of uh, Chris Jones with uh, uh, hyperbolic sines and cosines. Uh, this is the name of the distribution, harp hyper, shin, uh, shin, um, uh, hyperbolic sines and uh, uh, hyperbolic cosines. This is the name of the distribution specific distribution, an extension of the normal distribution, which allows to capture um, uh, correctly excess kurtosis. Therefore, in the literature, you have a lot of papers uh, that um, try to handle these problems of the tails of the distributions uh, that can, that enables us to uh, model returns of uh, returns uh, of an asset. Hmm? Returns, simple returns or log returns. Hmm? In the next part of the course, we are also going to try to explore the dependency between the returns. Hmm? If we have a low, if we have a formula which says that, let's say, a return, uh, a return RT, hmm? RT, let's say, imagine that RT is A times RT minus 1 plus epsilon, epsilon T. Let's say it looks like a regression model. Huh? Imagine you have this model here. You explore the dependency between the return at time t minus one and the return at time t. Therefore, that means that in fact you can construct things like this. And you have here errors epsilon t. You can subtract the different returns at times t times t minus one and have epsilon t and therefore you can reduce the problem of fitting a distribution on the returns to fitting a distribution on the differences here epsilon t and maybe in this case you have a way to okay to find a simpler distribution like the normal distribution for example for epsilon t this is another way to deal with this problem of fitting a distribution 
for the log returns. Either you try to model the log returns directly and you have to uh, imagine very specific, complicated distributions, or you can try to explore the dependency between the returns, log returns, and explore this and study the distribution of another quantity, RT, in this case, RT minus A times RT minus one epsilon T. And in this case, maybe you can find a simpler distribution for the epsilon T. That will be uh, included in the next part of this course. And now just to uh, describe almost the last part of, uh, of this course here, uh, we can discuss, uh, we have to discuss the fact that uh, most of the time we don't have only one return. As I said, I said we have RIT, uh, RIT, this is R1T, RNT. We have N assets at time T. We have a portfolio of N assets, I equals one to N. And RT here, this is the vector of, which represents the log returns of my portfolio. Unit. And what we want to know is to understand what is the distribution of the returns of my different assets at time T, if I know what happened during the previous times. RT minus one, R1 and theta. This is the parameter of this distribution. If, as I said, in a in a normal distribution, uh, in a multivariate normal distribution, this is the mean of each random variable, the variance of each random variables and the covariances between all the random variables inside the multivariate normal distribution. Huh? But okay, if we have, the interest is that. I want to predict what will happen tomorrow. I know what happened today and the days before for my returns, and I want to predict the return of my uh, different assets tomorrow. Therefore, I need to have the possible values for that. Therefore, roughly, I need to get the distribution of my different returns, given the fact that I know that the returns had a specific behavior, had this specific behavior uh, during the previous days up to date. And that corresponds to multivariate statistics. We have uh, uh, random vectors here. We have vectors of dimension N, capital N, corresponding to the N assets. And that relates to multivariate statistics. And in multivariate statistics, we use this notation. We say X is a vector of random variables, X1, XP. And we go to P in this case, P equals N in the case of the assets. And we say, okay, in this case, we have specific formula to describe the mean of x. The mean of x, this is the vector of means of each random variable, therefore of each return in this case. And a covariance function, which is denoted sigma x. And this covariance function, you see it has this form. This is a column vector, x minus mu x. This is a line vector, x minus mu x. If you multiply, these two vectors, you get a matrix. And on the diagonal elements of this matrix, what do you find? You find the variances of each random variable x1, xp. At the element 1, 1, you have the variance of x1. At the element pp, you will have the variance of the random variable xp. And what will appear on the non-diagonal elements of sigma x? The covariances between two of these random variables. At the position ij of this matrix, you can see by yourself, at the position ij, row i, column j, you find a quantity which corresponds to the covariance between random variable i, xi, and random variable j, xj. This is named the variance covariance matrix or the matrix of covariance, the covariance matrix for this multivariate random vector. If you want to estimate that, obviously the mean will be estimated by a classical average, but here we have xt, which is a vector. Therefore, you have here in this case, if you want to estimate 
this vector of means you have classical averages p classical averages to estimate this vector of means and if you want to estimate this matrix you use this formula 1 divided by t minus 1 classical formula and a sum here where you have a vector a column vector x t minus mu x and a row vector here thus you have here an estimator for a matrix you have a, uh, uh, you have a matrix this quantity leads to a matrix this is a sum of matrices and therefore on each diagonal elements you have estimators for the variances and on each non-diagonal elements you have estimators for the covariances also important when you talk about returns this is the likelihood function when you want to estimate parameters when you want to estimate the parameters of a normal distribution therefore the mean the variances the covariances in the multivariate uh, normal distribution you have to use a maximum likelihood technique and in the, in the maximum likelihood technique has been seen for iid data in previous courses of statistics but in the case of returns let's review let's go back five minutes on this uh, likelihood on, on this uh, uh, procedure on this likelihood function for returns and here we are going to consider that we are in a case where the returns can be dependent of each other at each time imagine here we have uh, a simple case a simple case where you have uh, at time t only one return vector of dimension one and you have at each time r t minus one r t minus two and so on up to r one you have returns at each time and you define here the conditional density of the return at time t given all the returns before imagine that you have the normal case very simple case for the, the, the log returns let's say imagine that you have the normal case therefore rt given all these returns is normally distributed to mean nu t and variance sigma squared t and you want uh, to estimate to find the maximum likelihood estimators for this mu t and this sigma squared t how do you get that how do you get that you use the classical likelihood function and you maximize this likelihood function with respect to the parameters that you want like in a classical likelihood function if you don't remember what is a maximum likelihood procedure go back to your basic courses of statistics and probability but what is f of R1, R2, RT minus 1, RT, no, I'm going to use capital T uh, to say that we have capital T uh, data in uh, our time series. Uh, here I have R1, R2, RT minus 1, RT, huh? and we know that what we would like to get is the vector of parameter theta, the vector of parameter in the case of a normal distribution, this is a set of means, a set of variance, set of covariances. Huh? For this is F of RT given rt minus 1 and all the other ones r2 r1 and theta times 
according to Bayes law, the, the density of RT minus 1, RT minus 2, RT minus 3, R2, I1. But the, the density of these random variables is in fact the density of RT minus 1 given RT minus 2 up to R2, R1, theta. times the density of these random variables. Hmm? But the density of these random variables is the density of RT minus 2 given RT minus 3 and so on up to R2, R1. Therefore, we can play this game a lot of time till we reach the end, F of R1 theta here. And this is what is written here, in fact. You have this F of R1 theta multiplied by all these conditional density functions. Product of all these density functions, and if you assume that all these density functions are normally distributed, that they have a form of normal distribution, you can write it here, and here you simply have the classical formula for a normal density function with mu t, sigma t, her sigma t, her. this is a classical formula for the normal distribution. And now if you want to compute from this, if you want to compute the uh, mean mu and the variance here, sigma, you just have to maximize this likelihood function with respect to mu and sigma. And f of r1 theta you can also say that it corresponds to a normal distribution. You just have an additional factor in your likelihood. It's possible to say that f r1 theta, okay, it's possible to say that it is, uh, no, it is normally distributed as well. Therefore, you can include it here inside this product. Now, just here we, 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 we uh, wrote f r1 of theta, in order to highlight the fact that we can rewrite this joint density function as a product of density function which goes up to f r1 theta. But this f r1 theta can be also modeled with a normal distribution in this case. Yeah, we also know that this is more complicated. This, this can be complicated to compute and this most of the time, the advice is to say when you have a likelihood like this, you put the logarithm of this likelihood. It is easier to maximize, therefore you have the logarithm of this joint density here, which can be written like this. And in this case, it's easier to find the maximum of this function. The maximum of this function, of the joint density here, is the same as the maximum of the joint, uh, of the logarithm of the joint density that is seen is ba in basic probability courses. Therefore, in basic probability courses, we review what is the maximum likelihood technique. That means to maximize the probability to observe what we observe. And here we apply it in the case of returns and in this very simple case of red of log returns that are conditionally distributed according to a normal distribution. This is not true really in practice. Because as we have seen, the log returns do not really have normal distribution, do not really follow a normal distribution. But the principle is the same. Maybe you don't have a normal distribution here, maybe you have a more complicated distribution, as I say, that with a hyperbolic sine cosine distribution, this strange name, as I said just before. But okay, it's possible in a classical likelihood procedure, it's possible to replace the normal distribution by this special, by any special distribution that could be, uh, that, that can be used and, and, and this, this distribution has some parameters, sometimes four, five, maybe six parameters. And by maximizing the likelihood function or the log likelihood function with this distribution, we can find estimators for the different parameters that appear in these complicated densities. That's the way we can handle 
the estimation of the parameters of the different distribution that will appear in financial time series. We have theta, a theta, which is a vector of parameters that appear in complicated densities and complicated distributions. We have to estimate it. How are we going to estimate this theta by classical uh, likelihood, maximum likelihood procedures? Okay, this now we have a good idea of uh, what are the returns. We have seen that, okay, our objective is to understand what will be the distribution of the return of tomorrow, given the fact that I know the returns uh, of the previous days. Therefore, we try to model these returns with different distributions. We try to understand how to estimate the parameters of these distributions. Therefore, we have good basis now to uh, go further in uh, the, the study of financial time series. And what will be the shape of this financial uh, time series? Just I give you some graphs here to show you what is the typical, what are the typical examples of time series that we will have to deal with. Here you have simple returns and here you have log returns. You see that they are very similar here. And that corresponds to the stocks IBM from January uh, this year, uh, 1926 to December 2003. Uh, and you see that these returns sometimes are more variable, sometimes less variable. It seems that the general mean doesn't move too much. But the question here is to say, okay, now I would like to see what will be the return here. What will be the distribution of the return here? What are the areas of values for the return that are the most likely tomorrow to have a good gain, to optimize my gain? Okay, this is one typical, uh, this is here, two typical time series obviously for the simple and the log returns respectively. And if you look at the way uh, you can uh, model these uh, distributions, you can model these returns for the simple returns here and for the log returns here, you see that uh, here you have uh, a comparison of empirical and normal densities for uh, for monthly simple and log returns of the IBM stock uh, during this period. Uh, and there, this here, you, you, you have two, uh, two curves. One curve here, the, the solid curve here, or here, corresponds to uh, cur uh, uh, density estimator. There are a lot of techniques to uh, estimate the density in statistics, to estimate the density of the different returns. It can be what we name a kernel, it's in this case a kernel density estimator, but that is similar to uh, what everybody knows uh, in, in the first courses of statistics and probability, the histogram. This is, it looks like the histogram computed on the different returns that you can see here, simple or log returns. And here you have in dotted line, dotted line here and here, uh, that corresponds to the best normal distribution that you could uh, use to model these data. Therefore, you take the normal distribution, you use the maximum likelihood to compute the mean and the variance, and you get this curve for the returns, this curve for the distribution, for the density of my uh, IBM stock. Hmm? This here 
uh, that corresponds to the possible values of the simple return. Just one remark here, the simple return, you know that there is a lower bound, which is minus one. Therefore, here you have a, uh, another scale to uh, express the, 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 the returns. I think it's in percentage, uh, not, in, uh, not in, uh, in absolute values. This maybe that explains why you have so low values of simple returns. And what we can see is that the normal distribution, okay, it seems to fit the simple returns and the log returns, but not really nicely. Eh? Here you see that there are problems in the tails. The uh, normal distribution has lower tails, lower tails here. And in the center, there are also problems. Eh? In the center, around zero, you have higher probabilities for uh, for for the the... The, the observed, I would say, the, the, the estimator of the density of the returns only based on the data and not on the normal distribution. Therefore, there are problems with the normal distribution and we can see that here already with this IBM stock. Other process that uh, we learn, that we will try to learn as well here is uh, the U.S. interest rates. Here you see U.S. interest rates uh, between two dates here with a 10-year, I think it's, yeah, 10-year, 10-year uh, maturity rate, uh, maturity rate, 10-year uh, treasury constant maturity rate above here and one year uh, maturity rate below. I don't know if it's easy to see the, the last line here in the legend, but this is the one year maturity rate here and uh, the 10 year maturity rate here. Therefore, here it's less variable than here, but you can see the, for the, the different interest rates, the involution, the evolution of the interest rate uh, according to uh, time here uh, in uh, this uh, series of, of um, of, of rates in this time series, in this financial time series. And finally here, you can also see the exchange rate uh, between US dollar and Japanese yen uh, between these two dates. Here you can see uh, between 2000 and 2004, at the beginning you have one dollar which is around 100 yens and therefore after it increases to reach an upper bound here above 130 uh, yens for one dollars and after it decreases here. For this is okay, this is a sequence. We can study this sequence, but what is also interesting, what is even I would say more interesting, this is the change in this exchange rate. The change in this exchange rate that means the difference between two successive rates. Because where do you want to invest? Where do you want to speculate? Where tomorrow you will have the highest change in interest rate. Therefore, what is interesting is the difference between two interest rates. And in fact, that becomes a series, a classical time series, which looks like the time series that we had here. Therefore, all these time series have things that are similar and we are going to try to extract these features to understand all the features of these specific data sets which consist of financial time series. Welcome to this course.